thank you very much for this very gentle introduc uh, introduction. Um, can you all hear me, first of all? OK, good. Um, this is a work that we have been doing um, partly uh, because we like it, partly because we are in a European project together with Ericsson and um, uh, Uppsala University and uh, uh, the National Technical University of Athens in Greece uh, and some other partners, but uh, this talk uh, mainly uh, is from these partners, uh, the context of a release project. Um, and uh, <clears throat> part of that work is to improve the scalability of the VM. Uh, I have to say this is not only my work. There are many people involved here. Uh, but I'm leading the uh, work package that uh, does this uh, work. So here's how the talk will go. I'll uh, start with a very brief overview. Um, things that uh, should be known to everybody, but I would like to establish the terminology. How uh, Erlang implements concurrency um, and some aspects of its concurrency model which are not so obvious the first time you hear about them. Uh, then I'll talk about the VM and its implementation. Uh, and uh, talk about some scalability improvements that have happened between various releases. Um, then I will introduce Bench Earl. It's something that I also talked uh, two years ago, but we have improved on it, and I will show you um, a live demo of, uh, or actually the results of uh, running Bench Earl on a bunch of applications in different OTP releases. And with that, I will try to, sh to talk a bit about the scalability improvements that have been um, uh, happening in an OTP system uh, near you. Um, the, the ones that have happened mainly from starting from uh, R14 and R15 on. Um, and uh, finally, I will talk about the scalability of the Erlang term storage, why I think it's important to improve on the Erlang term storage and um, what uh, we are currently working on. So uh, although uh, there is a video recording and this is being recorded, feel free to interrupt at any point. I would like to make it more uh, an exciting talk as opposed to just uh, something that I speak and you listen. So this is what Erlang is about, some uh, buzzwords. Um, it's a functional language, has single assignment. It's a concurrent language. Uh, it's supported distribution. Its concurrency model is built on message passing. Uh, it supports soft real-time characteristics of systems. Uh, it has a very nice model for fault tolerance. Uh, it's claimed to be no sharing, at least at the conceptual level. Um, it uh, has garbage collection. Uh, it uh, comes with a virtual machine implementation. Um, uh, it's called Beam, and those of you that are following the Erlang question list, you can see that uh, there is some uh, issues there. Um, um, then it also comes with a native code compiler, which is integrated into the Erlang OTP system these days, uh, the Hype compiler. Um, it uh, supports hot swapping of code. It has multiprocessor support for quite a years now. Uh, it comes with various libraries uh, that uh, should or should not be called OTP, but they are, and um, it's um, an open source system. So in this talk, I will mainly concentrate on the ones that are shown in bold here, the no sharing aspect of the system, and uh, wh whether this is really true or not. Um, the uh, aspects of the virtual machine, and how this is implemented, and uh, of course, talk extensively about multiprocessor support and how this has improved over OTP releases. So, um, Erlang is interesting because it's appropriate for um, large scale concurrent execution, uh, because concurrency is built into the language, uh, and it's not an afterthought as in other languages out there, uh, or is provided by library. It's not like that. Um, so it, uh, by default, it supports the shared nothing concurrency model, meaning that uh, by default, processes share no data between them. Uh, this has various nice uh, side effects because it requires no explicit locking at the programming level, and in principle, scales well. So you can make a very scalable system uh, with that concurrency model in mind. 
Uh, more importantly, it significantly eases concurrent programming because you don't have to think about certain bad things that can happen uh, when you program with uh, locks and uh, threads and stuff like that. Okay, so you know this stuff already. Um, so what happens at the ex execution level is whenever a program is running, the code is executed by some process. And a process keeps track of its current program point, of course, in the program that where it's executing, uh, the values of variables, the call stack, and so on. And each process has a unique program identifier, process identifier, that can be used to identify the process. And processes are concurrent. So in principle, they can run in parallel if you have enough resources in your system, if you have enough logical cores in your system. Um, so different processes may be reading, of course, the same program code at the same time. They have their own data. Um, they have their own program point in the, where they are in the execution. And they have their, their own stack. Uh, and only the text of the program is being shared, conceptually at least. And the programmer does not have to think about other processes updating the state, okay? So uh, there are no global variables, so to say. So there's no locking that is needed at the program level. Okay, so you know all this stuff, so I'm going very fast here. But I need them to introduce um, how this concurrency is implemented at the level of the VM. So in uh, the Erlang VM, the processes are implemented by the runtime system of the virtual machine, not by OS threads. So what's actually implemented by OS threads are the schedulers, okay, not the processes themselves. And multitasking is preemptive. So the, it's, the VM does its own process and, uh, scheduling and switching between processes. It's not at the mercy of the operating system. This has both pros and cons, but that's how it's implemented. Now, processes by default use very little memory. Um, and whenever they need to uh, expand it, they um, uh, expand it by calling the system malloc, typically. Um, and uh, switching between processes is very fast. Uh, it's at the responsibility of the schedulers. And Erlang can, in principle, handle very large numbers of processes. Some applications use many thousands of them. You probably have one application like that, or you should have one application like that. Um, now, uh, on multi-cores, uh, processes can be scheduled to run actually truly parallel, truly concurrently, uh, on separate logical cores. And uh, by default, the system starts with as many schedulers as you have logical cores in your uh, machine. So you start processes by uh, using the spawn functions, and there is the modern version of the spawn functions, uh, of the spawn function, uh, the one with the fun, and the other one that is not fun to use, um, the one with the module function and uh, function name and, arith and uh, arguments. So um, the new process will run the specified function or closure that you pass it as an argument. And the spawn operation is uh, something that returns immediately. It's something that is, in, uh, that is executing quite fast. So process creation is claimed to be very fast. Um, in practice, actually, uh, it's, uh, it very much depends. So this is not a very meaningless statement, a very meaningful statement is a bit underspecified. Um, in reality, too, uh, the process creation is, um, uh, has a cost proportional to the size of the arguments that you have to pass. Okay, so when you spawn um, a process, you have to pass it some arguments. Okay, this is not so clear in the fun version, but in the uh, one with the... Uh, with RT3, you can see it clearly that you have to pass and literally copy these terms from one process heap to some other process heap. Um, okay, so that's how you start processes. 
Now, the Erlang's runtime system handles the basic built-in things like memory allocation, garbage collection, process creation, message passing, process scheduling. It does all these things and it does quite nicely, actually. And there are various different ways that one can structure the runtime system. Um, the current runtime system comes with a particular architecture um, that has been around for quite a number of years, but this is not the only one that you could use to structure a runtime system. You could use uh, uh, something with a shared heap, uh, something with a, uh, some parts of uh, the heaps of processes being process local, and some other part being shared. There are various ways that you can structure this, and this has been studied long ago by my group, and not only. Um, unfortunately, they were studied long ago when we had uh, uh, effectively unicore machines uh, rather than multi-core machines. So uh, you can view it as an abstraction like that, that each process uh, has um, a process control block. It's a fixed memory for some of the things that it needs, like a pointer to its message queue and uh, stuff like that. And then has a stack and a heap that conceptually grow towards each other. And uh, the stack can be bigger than the heap, or the heap uh, typically is bigger than the stack, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, these are handled by the runtime system. So in, in principle, here, uh, processes don't share any memory whatsoever. In real, so this, this, uh, this organization has the following uh, advantages. It provides isolation and robustness. So if a process crashes, uh, nothing bad happens to the other processes. Uh, very importantly is that processes can, give, uh, they can get, be garbage collected independently. So in principle, you do not have a global point of synchronization that you typically had in a system that would have these things in a shared heap, or that you would have in a, if you implemented, say, um, Erlang by a Java virtual machine, where you would have to effectively synchronize uh, whenever uh, GC was happening. And uh, even, uh, you know, more uh, sneakingly, you have uh, something, you can play a trick with this. You can have a very fast memory deallocation when a process terminates. Because uh, a process that has a long computation, for example, that um, computes something and uh, needs a lot of heap space to do that sort of thing, can expand its heap on its own, and then compute its result, send it by a message, and commit harakiri at that time. Uh, and uh, it's, um, um, uh, all its memory will be deallocated in constant time because the runtime system can just grab it immediately. Okay, so you don't need to invoke a garbage collection in these cases. So that's the nice things that it happens, that it has this organization. There are some um, drawbacks in this organization. Messages need to be copied. And as we saw in the previous slide, uh, also arguments have to be copied when you spawn a new process. Uh, and this happens even between processes on the same machine, on the same core. So even if uh, you know, it so happens that uh, you are executing all your processes on the same schedule, you have to copy them, really. So in the, the send operation in Erlang is, uh, proportional, has cost proportional to the size of the messages that you send. And as a matter of fact, it's even worse than that because you lose the sharing that might exist in um, the messages that, in the terms that you use as messages. Also, uh, if you look at the uh, memory management uh, or the memory allocation as a whole in the system, you have higher fragmentation because the memory is scattered between processes uh, and it's not a global, it's not, uh, there's no global way of uh, recovering, say, the process of, uh, the memory of a process and giving it to some, uh, some other one. Okay. So, 
Okay, so this is one way of doing it. The truth is actually that this is just an idealized picture. The real picture looks pretty much like that. You do have some global areas in um, the Erlang VM. In particular, the atom table is shared between all the processes. And it's a resource that uh, can crash the system if you try to put too many atoms. Uh, the process registry is shared between all the processes. Whenever you do a register, uh, this is something that is global uh, to all the system. And then, of course, you have two more areas which are bigger, a bigger problem than the other ones. You have the ETS uh, space, the Erlang term storage space, that, of course, can be private, but uh, uh, its interesting use, I would say, is for public ETS tables, uh, which are shared between all the processes and have destructive updates. And you have a big binary area. So all the binaries that are above a certain size, certain uh, term size, are put there. Uh, and um, OK, you don't have destructive updates in that uh, area unless you use some very sneaky hype built-ins. But um, don't quote me on this. Um, but uh, in principle, it's a shared resource. So this is what happens really at um, the level of um, um, the virtual machine as it was uh, about 10 years ago. What happens these days is that you have a situation that looks like this one. You have a bunch of schedulers, each of them having uh, its own queue and managing a number of processes that might or might not be in the same uh, uh, memory area. Uh, the, uh, and then you have the global uh, space, which is shared between all these processes. And this is what happens at the SMP architecture on, the, on a single node, on a single OS process. When you go to distribution, uh, whether this is uh, actual distribution between different machines or it's distribution between different Erlang nodes, it doesn't matter really. But the situation looks like this one, where you have multiple of these things uh, communicating through each other, uh, with each other through uh, the distribution protocol. Uh, and each of these uh, blue boxes here is a single VM node. Um, so it's a single node running a single VM. Um, yeah. OK, so that's how uh, the Erlang VM uh, is uh, more or less structured. So. Uh, this is what uh, you know, existed uh, there before we started this project. Uh, a bit of advertisement for this project is a project that has been going on between, um, it started in October 2011, and it will be going on actually till the beginning of 2015. It officially ends on the September 2014, but it will be extended a bit. It has a bunch of partners whose logos you can see here. Um, and uh, it has various goals. The main grandiose goal is to scale Erlang's concurrency-oriented programming paradigm to build reliable general purpose software, such as server-based systems on massively parallel uh, machines, a ranging of uh, ten th tens of thousands of cores. Um, so it tries to um, support language primitives for scalable distribution. Uh, virtual machine extensions and improvements, tools for parallelizing refactoring existing code, tools for profiling and testing for errors, scalable virtualization infrastructure, and we're trying to port the Erlang OTP system into a blue gene uh, machine of IBM. From IBM, actually, not of IBM, of EDF in France, but. Uh, so this talk uh, is uh, concerned with the virtual machine extensions and improvements that have happened in the system. 
And this is what uh, roughly we are doing. We are extending and redesigning core elements of the, of the VM to, ex to improve, to, to remove some bottlenecks that might exist there. So as part of this, we have investigating um, the scalability of various Erlang applications, uh, starting from small benchmarks, but extending it this to applications, and try to identify bottlenecks and prioritize the changes. We are designing a more scalable Erlang term storage. Part of it is already in er uh, Erlang OTP. Some other part we are trying to uh, work together with uh, the Ericsson team to see if we can uh, squeeze some fancy changes in there. Um, then uh, we are extending um, the runtime system to be more scalable um, in ways that reduces the need for copying data, improves the scheduler, uh, and the schedulers have been improved over uh, the latest releases, and also su support fine-grained parallelism. Uh, we are building some tools uh, for online profiling. In particular, um, we've done quite a lot of work on uh, D-Trace support that exists already in our OTP system. Uh, in case you did not know about it, there is this uh, already there. And more is coming, I think. And we are porting the VM to the massively parallel platforms, as I said. Now, some improvements to the VM that I will just um, mention here, and uh, you can talk to me later, or I, po I can point you to long uh, documents that describe these things. Uh, there have been log-free data structures for some key components of the VM, in particular the uh, schedulers of the queues. Um, some optimization of process tables inside the VM. Um, and optimizations in the area of port locks inside the VM. Ports are quite important for various things in the Erlang VM. Uh, and the uh, Erlang OTP uh, team has done a lot of work in this area. Um, then uh, the memory uh, handling and the migration of memory between schedulers has uh, had a serious uh, uh, surgery uh, that was successful, actually. There is a new allocator start strategy starting with uh, R16BO2 uh, called Address Order First Carrier Best Fit. You don't want me right now to explain what this is, but you can, can point you to documents that say this thing. Um, so it's also in, uh, they have added infrastructure to collect information about le lengthy blocking of schedulers. This is something that has been observed in some applications. Um, uh, and uh, there is already infrastructure to, to find this information. And uh, also uh, some improvements that make computations which potentially can take long time interruptible. Um, uh, this is for some BIFs in particular, but uh, the support of it has been extended. And uh, in uh, 17, uh, there will be uh, even more goodies in that area. Um, then uh, there are some other uh, things that um, uh, the, OTP the OTP team is working on, in particular dirty schedulers uh, for executing blocking on long running uh, C code uh, and uh, other stuff that I will not really have time to explain right now. I would like to uh, point uh, uh, now talk about the bench a bit. It's something that we have uh, done in the context of the release project. Uh, you can download it or you can find out about it in this URL. Um, the URL um, looks like this one. It's a scalability benchmark suite for Erlang OTP um, where you can find a lot of benchmarks and uh, other uh, uh, information about bench uh, and it's very easy. Uh, all the code is on GitHub. Um, it's obviously open source. Uh, and uh, you can build it very fast with uh, these um, uh, commands, which I just included there so that uh, you see that it's actually very fast uh, and not very difficult to build. So we started with 14 concurrent programs, uh, which have been used before at Ericsson to benchmark uh, the performance of the SMP implementation. 
and we have added some bigger applications. We welcome additions. So if you have an application that requires scalability improvements, uh, if you uh, contributed to Ben Churl, chances are that the VM will do something nice about your application in a future OTP release. Hint, hint. Um, so um, the Ben Churl system is an infrastructure to measure performance of the system as the number of cores increases. So it's a scalability benchmark suite. So we would like to see how applications scale with the number of schedulers. And uh, on the site, uh, on the web page, you can show scalability results of uh, various architectures. Uh, they are a bit old by now, so I will show you newer results today. Um, so Benchurl is a tool um, to analyze and run benchmarks or applications, uh, and uh, it's extensible, extensible. So it's very, very simple to add a new benchmark there uh, and to uh, make it run with the current infrastructure. So it focuses the scale on scalability with respect to the following um, parameters. The number of Erlang nodes, if you have distributed benchmarks. The number of CPU cores uh, that you have on, um, um, on a single VM. The number of schedulers that you start a VM with. Uh, the Erlang OTP release and flavor that you are using and settings of various command line parameters. So you can play with all these things and find measurements that um, show uh, how your favorite Erlang system performs if you tweak, say, some command line para arguments. Like, um, how do you map schedulers into threads, into cores? Okay, um, so I had a lot of slides here that show how Ben Churl is, uh, um, how the architecture of Ben Churl looks like, uh, but I will actually skip them and go directly to the demo part because I think it's a bit more interesting. So those of you that have a laptop open or a handheld device open can actually go to this URL, uh, http sandy.it.uu.se on port 8001, and you can play with me uh, on this uh, benchmark results. It's totally interactive. And I will play here on my laptop because I didn't trust the network. Uh, so I have everything locally also. But you can see exactly the same things on that URL. I can say it again, sandy.it.uu.se at port 8001. Okay? Now, let me start with one of them. So this is a, um, a benchmark called BIG. And uh, you can, uh, for example, see how the time looks when you run this benchmark on a number of uh, schedulers. So this is a machine that has 32 physical cores. And uh, it's an Intel machine, so it has 64 logical cores. And this graph here shows time in milliseconds. And this is the number, how the benchmark behaves as you increase the number of schedulers, as you increase the parallelism that exists. You can see the same thing in speed up, in speed ups that you get. And uh, you can actually play and see, uh, I can deselect all and just see the uh, speed up that you get on, um, say, running R13, BO3 actually, with the default args. And you can see that uh, uh, I would uh, urge you to actually look at the following numbers at eight schedulers, 16 and 32, which are the interesting ones for this architecture. Uh, eight means that you are running on 
a single chip with all the cores um, having uh, all the physical cores having a scheduler. 16 means that you are running again on the single chip, but with a logical cores. And 32 means that you are using really all the physical cores that you have in this machine. So this is R13. You can see how the situation has changed in R14. It actually become, became worse in R14, BO3, for some reason, uh, in, uh, in this, for this benchmark. Uh, in R15, things have improved compared to R14, but R13 seems to be a bit faster still. In R15, BO2, uh, things have improved even a bit more, but still, here the R13 is a bit better. In R16, BO1, uh, things have deteriorated a bit again. Uh, in R16, BO3, uh, things now have... Uh, 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 it's this one, they have deteriorated even a bit more. And uh, in R17, um, it's somewhere here in between. Okay, so you can play with these things on your leisure. Um, let's show you some other one, it's Mandelbrot. This is a benchmark that scales very, very nicely. Uh, you get about 25 speed up on 32 cores, which is very, very good. This is the whole application. This is not just the core of the tight loop. Eh? Uh, so this reads, um, for example, it does all the input output uh, and stuff. Uh, and uh, here, interesting things to note is that um, this here, the latest releases have improved compared to the R13 and R14. So these are the benchmarks that show, um, you know, really good scalability. But there are other ones, like this EHB which is, stands for Erlang Hack Bench. So let me uh, show time first and deselect all to show it slowly. So this is what was happening in R13BO3. Okay, you can see that the time um, uh, was um, modular noise here. The time was effectively decreasing when you were running on a single core and increasing again when you started going and the NUMA effects became more visible. In R14, pretty much similar situation. And then good things happen to an OTP system near you. From R15 on, the scalability is what you would expect here. There have been improvements in the system. can point you to, to which ones that have made now this, this particular program scale. And from R15, this was R15, R15 BO2 uh, has made the situation, you know, pretty much the same. R16 even better, not very by much. R16 BO, uh, BO3 a bit better, and R17 is somewhere where you would expect. Uh, this were time, so let me unselect these two outliers and show you the speed ups that you get in this one. And the good news is that R17 here is, has improved the situation even more. Now, uh, let me show you some other one, which is moves, which is an interesting one. So, let me deselect all and show it slowly. So this is the speed up that you get um, on R13. You can see that this is not a program that you can parallelize quite, quite easily. Uh, among other things, it uses ETS. 
for because you need to, to use ETS uh, to store uh, information that all the processes need to access. In R14, uh, some things improved, but still the scalability that you get is not so uh, good. In R15, pretty much the same. Um, in R15, DO2, again, almost the same. In R16, a bit better, but not really much. Uh, in R16, DO3, um, about the same. It's a bit better here because it goes up to here. Uh, unfortunately, the legends come on top, so you cannot see it. But if you have a bigger screen, you can actually shrink these or make them bigger and see them even better. I have a bigger screen, but it's not visible on this projector, so I cannot use it. Now, the bad news is that here, R17 is very bad. <laughs> and part of the reason has to be with that the scheduling, um, the, the pinning of threads has changed in R17. It became from, um, and you can see it actually on just concentrating on the moves, this is what you would get. Um, so this is just moves uh, with the default args without specifying any scheduling pin policy uh, strategy. And this is what you would get if you have NNTS as a scheduling, as a scheduling uh, pinning strategy. And here, things are much better. R17 now at least scales on this benchmark. Anyway, so enough about this. There are more benchmarks that you can play. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, we very much welcome additions. So if you have a program that you you don't get the scalability that you expect from it. Please contribute it uh, to Benchurl, and I'm pretty sure that good things will happen to it. Yes? So based on everything we've seen, why do you think R13 DO3 on these graphs is higher than everything else? Why do you think the cost of performance has gone down? Uh, what has gone down? Is this, is this not higher and greater? Is it better? Uh, well, yes and no. So you have to look at the times. So at the end, you are interested in the times of your. But we are measuring here the scalability because the VM is interested in actually making um, the overall execution better and more scalable. OK? So it doesn't really matter too much whether you have a maximum scalability of, uh, say, 21 and a half or whatever this is versus uh, 20. You have to look at the time, really, to understand what's happening. Okay. So even though these are showing a significant deviation between 13 and 17, we really shouldn't really care about them. We should really only care about the times. You should care about the times, but you should, uh, if, you, if you have an application that you expect to scale and it doesn't, you should be worried. Because the time would even be, even be better. Okay? So um, I think you are interested in the time eff effectively. I mean, it, it very much depends on your application, what you are interested in. Are you interested in throughput? Are you interested in time? Are you interested in, I don't know, servicing how many? Uh, it, it depends. Are you interested in using your machines effectively? It very much depends on what you are interested in. And this is application dependent. Uh, here we are interested in optimizing the VM. And of course, um, the VM um, you know, has to serve all the programs, not just your program. Let me show you one last thing, which is the edge test. And I will, uh, since I don't have that much time, I will just di go directly to the speed up that you get. So I will deselect all and show you the speed up that you get in R13. This is negative speed up. 
So this is uh, having an edge table that many processes are trying to access concurrently at the same time. Okay? So this is an edge have locks. And locks are not just bad, not evil, but also a scalability bottleneck. So as you increase here the number of processes, the, the performance of your system really becomes very bad. And you can see this on time also. The time increases very bad. OK, so I would, if you got uh, uh, from the previous graphs the information that R13 is better, uh, this is really not the case. I guarantee you on this. I wish I could tell you that 17 is the best for everything. It's not the case. But clearly, 17 is a better system than 13. That's what I can tell you. You can quote me on this. <laughs> now, things have improved in the Edge uh, front. In particular, R14 has made the situation a bit better, but still negative uh, speed ups, negative scalability. And negative time and uh, slow downs actually in time. R15 was the first system that showed some signs of promise, but then it died. <laughs> after a number of, after that many schedulers, four in this particular case, uh, and barely making it on eight, then it died. Uh, R15 BO2 was pretty much similar. Oops. R16 BO1 improved a bit the situation. At least now you get speed ups, or, or at least you don't get slowed down anymore. R16 BO3 was pretty much similar, and R17 is also there, not exactly, but also there. Now, which brings me to the last part of my talk, which is the scalability of the air long-term storage. And this is work that I've done with two of my, two of my students in Uppsala. So the air long-term storage is a key component of Erlang OTP. It's a value stored mechanism. It's heavily used in applications. It supports Mnesia and provides shared memory with destructive updates. Uh, it's crucial for parallelization, um, especially if you want to avoid copying all the arguments of terms when you spawn new processes. And as we saw here, it might be a scalability bottleneck in applications. So why do we care about this? This is a slide from Klarna. Um, I like it very much. Uh, it shows Klarna's system um, in, uh, when it's running. And the interesting numbers are those with red. I hope they are visible. Um, it's running uh, on, 50, on 530 gigabytes of RAM. It supports 1 uh, 1,600 processes right now, uh, concurrently. And out of this uh, total of 493 used uh, memory, the 440 uh, four is edge tables. Okay? Um, so, no matter what you do to the rest of the system, if you don't optimize these 474 uh, gigabytes of memory and the access to them, you're going to die. Okay. So, edge, uh, you know how to use it. I would like to concentrate on these two options that have been added in recent OTPs. And it shows actually one of the reasons, they are part of the reason why you have, at least you don't have negative scalability anymore in recent releases. If you haven't used them ever, uh, try to play with them. They are very good. Or at least they improve uh, the situation from uh, terrible to acceptable. They, they have a, a space um, um, cost, uh, but uh, really they really should be enabled by default, especially one of them should be enabled by default. 
and arguably should be really enabled by default and you can disable them. But the OTP team is very concerned about uh, backwards compatibility. Um, we can talk of this offline, but uh, anyway, this is how uh, ads uh, are um, um, organized at uh, uh, the implementation level. Uh, I don't have time to explain all these things, but basically there are two kinds of edge tables, those that are based on hashing, and these support sets, bugs, and duplicate bugs, and those that are based on ordered sets, which are implemented by AVL trees, um, and uh, depending on the type you have, you either have a hash table or an AVL tree. Now, the other nice thing about it is that there are various, various locks here. Uh, the other thing to note in the picture is that there are various locks involved when you use ETS. And, ETS are a and locks are a scalability problem. And therefore, ETS is a scalability problem for Erlang applications. Um, so, uh, let, me, let me skip this stuff and go directly to the how ETS has evolved over OTP. Uh, over various different um, Erlang OTP releases. The R11 was the first version with SMP support, not in ETS, but in anything. Uh, the first uh, real support for uh, scalable ETS came in R13 BO2 with a write concurrency option that was in, uh, introduced. Uh, this activates an array of readers, writers, locks on buckets, so it's only, <coughs> the scalable lets are only those that are based on hashing. The uh, ordered set implementation currently sucks big time. Um, in uh, R14, um, the, intro, the OTP system introduced this write, read concurrency option that um, maps scheduler to readers groups and every reader group has its own read counter, so that avoids uh, sharing in the caches, and this gives much better scalability. And uh, to even improve the situation further, in R16 we have more reader groups and more locks, more fine-grained locks. This is not a bad thing. It means that you have lock for a smaller part of the table. Uh, so this is uh, what the benchmark does. And here are the numbers. And you can see here that R11 was uh, terrible as far as uh, uh, time is concerned, as you increase the number of schedulers. R13, with its support for read concurrency, has improved a bit the situation, but it's not there yet. And uh, from R14 on and R16, at least you get some non-degradation in the performance when you use ETS. Uh, same thing here, but uh, varying the number of lookups versus updates. The previous uh, uh, was for type set. This is for ordered set. And for ordered set, you can see how here that the scalability deteriorates after when you go off the chip, when you go into a different uh, NUMA uh, node. Uh, I have some more slides, but I don't have time to show them, so I will skip them. So here are some lessons learned from scaling the ETS. You can find more information on a paper we have written on this uh, subject, and also on the slides after uh, they will be put on the web. I will put all the slides here, not just the ones I showed. Um, uh, order set needs to be fixed because it's like a scalability bottleneck right now. Uh, locking is still a problem, uh, but has gotten much better in uh, recent releases. NUMA is a big problem these days, especially if you have machines with many cores, like uh, this one that we have been using. It's not a problem if you are running on a laptop, on an i7 or something like that. But if you want to employ Erlang on big servers, uh, it's an issue. Um, we need to use some effective pinning on NUMA, 
uh, moving schedulers between nodes is very, very, very bad. Uh, we, um, you should use read concurrency on when you're doing only lookups. And you should definitely enable write concurrency, pretty much. This should be enabled by default. And of course, measure your own case, because they are not general advice. It depends on what you're doing with ads. I will stop here, uh, and I'll thank you for your attention. We have time for maybe two questions. Yep. Are there any experiments that you use in Quora on GPU-2? Are there any experiments on using uh, the, cures, the cores on GPUs? Um, not that I know of. It's the honest uh, answer. Uh, but I'm not so sure that Erlang is very suited for uh, this kind of uh, GPU programming, or the, the, the current GPU programming that there is. You need the race. You need you know, some very regular computations to use GPUs effectively. Uh, and Erlang doesn't come with an array data type and with. Yes. Yep. Read concurrency. So from your lab, well, before this one, before this slide, I assume it's uh, only when using lookup. So you said that there's a space uh, problem. What, what, what it's not a space problem. Uh, I didn't say that sort of thing. I said that it comes with a, spe with a memory overhead. With the, you, know, you increase your, uh, the memory that you need. Is that it? That's it. Okay. And of course, you know, in modern architectures, if you uh, increase the memory, you typ typically translates a bit in time, uh, but uh, not by much, I think.